Good day to you, dear beloved of God and of mine. Thanks for watching and welcome, of course, to this video. We are continuing our uh, series about the mindset, our mindset. With what mindset are we studying God's word? And in order to understand that as much and as deeply as possible, I started, I would say, the the largest part of this study with laying down the very important foundational principles around what is truth and what is lie. This is very, very important. So I hope, I still hope that you have learned from it, but that you really have grown from it and now understand much better what it is, what it means to stand in truth and also to stand in the lie. What does it mean? Because we are still in our mortal bodies, in these, fle in these flesh bodies, so to speak. And that means that uh, we, we can sin every day, every day, even when we realize the grace of God, still we can sin. We will sin less and less, we know that. I, I can speak out of my own experience. I know that that is the case but still we can sin on a daily basis even so take that into account and first try to learn and try to ponder on these things okay we'll go uh, to the slides this was the last slide <coughs> excuse me um, i was also thinking um, about that parable of lazarus and the rich man and I was thinking back because I told you in the last video that when I grew up in church, people used to tell me, no, this one is not a parable. This one is not a parable. And, and when I was thinking back after the video, the previous video, I, I remember that people used to say that to me in a triumphant tone. Like, this is not a parable. No, no, no not don't don't let yourself be fooled this one is the truth this is a true story not a parable and it's like they want to be right about it and they don't even ponder the deeper consequence of it that means that people even one creature but billions in their mind will be tormented without end think about that Think about it. And that is the image of God that they have. That's the image. That's their God. And I don't know if you know this, but I will share this with you. People tend to imitate their God. Did you know that? Oh yes. Again, people tend to imitate their view of God, of course. And if your God is a heartless, cold monster that without any end will torment people, thousands, millions, billions, then think about yourself, what you have become or what you will become in the end times as an example. So ponder on that as well. Very important. So we ended last video with this slide. <coughs> Um, so the question, I will do the, the last two um, bullet points. The question is, do you become happy because everyone will ultimately be saved? Does it make you happy? And God actually turns out to be truly love and never lets the works of his hands go to waste. Never. Does it make you happy, joyous? Or do you get angry like Jonah before you, be, because you secretly hoped that God would endlessly torment that terrible neighbor or that merciless criminal, etc.? Think about it and be honest to yourself because it's yourself that, ha that will experience the consequence in a relative way, of course. So is there a secret hope in your heart that God will endlessly torment people? This secret hope, 
this secret hope that some people will be endlessly lost is actually a good example of injustice. Did you know that? Of course. Again, I mentioned it. I mentioned it earlier in videos, these videos of this series. I'll mention it again. Limited sins, right? And if limited sins are punished with unlimited pain and suffering, then it is a clear example of injustice. Clear. Because it's not righteous. Not righteous. If you work hard and at the end of the month you get good wages for your hard work, you are satisfied because the wages reflect the quality and the intensity of your work. So you are satisfied. That's righteous. If you sin, whatever sin you done, you've done, but you are an, a, a limited person, you are limited, made of clay, clay, we are clay, we are limited. And the, if that is being rewarded in the negative sense with unlimited punishment and pain and suffering in fire, but even if it's not fire, but annihilation, because many people believe that people will be annihilated. That means that they will be killed by God and they will be dead forever. But that's also being lost. You are lost. And the question is, if you as God's creature are lost, who is the loser? Oh yeah, the owner. The owner is the loser, not the object that is lost. But the owner has lost the object. He is the loser. So you're, you're telling then that God is the loser. That's what you say. If even one of his creatures uh, is lost. So think about that as well. This is a great example of injustice. Total injustice. There is a passage and that's also mentioned earlier in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 11, 12 that addresses this very mindset. Let's read it again. And therefore, God will be sending them an operation of deception for them to believe the falsehood that all may be judged who do not believe the truth but delight in injustice. Because I can tell you that if you want in your heart, you want some people to be eternally lost, then you are delighting in injustice, unrighteousness. And if you are among those who secretly do not want all people to be saved, then this passage in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 11, 12 is about you it's about you okay well then let's do another example for good measure right it is written in first corinthians 15 uh verse 22 for even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. That means made alive beyond the reach of death. That means made immortal. All. Let's go over it. This is again what I mentioned already earlier. This is a perfect parallel. So what constitutes the parallel to be perfect? These two expressions. Even as and the same color, thus also. That means exactly in the same way. Again, 
even as one side of the equation does also in the same in the exact same way the other side of the equation let's take a look at the sides of the equation for even as the first side of the equation is in Adam all are dying we agree on that one right everybody every Christian would say yes all are dying in Adam no exceptions okay if that's the case again if that is the case and that is the case we have an even as here even if even as this is the case exactly in the same way in Christ shall all be vivified in Adam all are dying in Christ shall all be vivified it will happen in the future but it's a fact that it will happen it's a guarantee the same way same equation I hope you see that now and that also means that ultimately eventually all will end up in Christ being in Christ not only believers of now at the end of God's plan all humanity all mankind will come in to be in Christ why do I know that because all enemies of Christ will be put on subjected under Christ's feet by God all the enemies will be dethroned and subjected to Christ by God and that will be uh, happening at the end of God's plan it will be victorious that's the God whom I serve that's the God who I see in whom I believe okay so when I point out out when I pound sorry when I point out to Christians the fact that God will ultimately make all alive meaning immortal using this passage as one of many many examples they almost all interpret this the way they want to see it the way they want to see it namely the all in Adam really concerns all humanity but the all in Christ only concerns those who are in Christ now during their life here on earth i.e. those who believe currently now is that the case no of course not there is a difference between believers now and people who will die in unbelief yes but that difference is that the believers now will later serve they will serve the unbelievers yes believers now will lead the unbelievers into subjection to God into reconciliation with God from enmity to friends and even family so this is what Christians say they just want to see that because it suits them better again they just want to see it like that because it suits them better then they could feel this is the crux of the matter then they could feel superior toward others and this is exactly the definition of self-righteousness and trust me self-right self-righteousness is among the worst of all sins oh yes of course think about it so this is so important to to be honest about to toward yourself so important to be able to see the truth but that cannot be true if you read the sentence this sentence neutrally that means as an outsider if you read this sentence as an outsider you will easily see 
that it is the truth. It's a perfect comparison. You only have to look, I told you already, at, at the words even as and even so or thus also in the same way, in the exact same way. Just look at those words to see that this is a perfect comparison or perfect parallel. So my recommendation to you is go for truth no matter what. Go for the truth. As a result, you quickly conclude that both the all in Adam and the all in Christ at the end of God's plan really include all of humanity. In the end, all will believe and become to be come to be in Christ, of course. Let's read. Isaiah, because this is what God will do, not we. We will not do anything. God, this is God's show. Everything is God's show. So this is God's achievement. Isaiah 45:23. God Yahweh says this: By myself have I sworn, from my mouth has gone forth righteousness, righteousness, a word, and it shall not turn back. For to me shall bow every knee, and every tongue sh shall swear fealty. The same uh, expression is also mentioned more or less in Romans 14, 11. For it is written, Living am I, the Lord is saying, for to me shall bow every knee, and every tongue shall be acclaiming God. Acclaiming means, it comes from the Greek word ex homologeo, that means from the inside out. That means you mean it from the bottom of your heart. That's what ex homologeo means. And now the well-known version of this expression, Philippians 2, verse 10 and 11, that in the name of Jesus, every knee should be bowing, celestial and terrestrial and subterranean. And every tongue should be acclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. And again, the moment that every tongue, that a tongue, even one tongue, is acclaiming this, it comes from the depth of their heart. Let's read uh, a confirmation of that. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, uh, verse 3, where it says, No one speaking by God's Spirit is saying, Anathema is Jesus. And no one is able to say Lord is Jesus or Jesus is Lord except by Holy Spirit. So the fact that they will acclaim that every one of us will acclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord will be done through Holy Spirit only inspired by Holy Spirit. That's the point. So this is the confirmation. It will happen for everyone. Everyone. There are, of course, countless types of examples. Of course. But let's consider and realize the fact that God's word is completely reliable. Keep in mind that also every word in scripture has been very carefully and precisely chosen selected and has been even purified seven times read psalms uh, 12 verse 6 and you will see the confirmation it is with this mindset that we would study god's word so that the uh, sorry this mindset means the mindset that god's word is completely reliable and every word has been care carefully and precisely chosen and purified seven times. Every word. 
So if we have this mindset, then we would study God's word so that we may dwell on all that is recorded, knowing that everything stated is with a specific reason. God just does this. He sets so-called soft traps. This is what you already have understood throughout this study. God says, he says, he sets so-called soft traps so that those with a relatively bad attitude of heart will fall into them and can and will be judged for their own benefit and education. And that is exactly what will happen with billions of people before they will get saved in the end. So God sends an operation of deception because those people reject the true God. That's the point. Again, I'm talking relatively here. So he sends an operation of deception so that uh, he gives them over to their own lusts and their own desires. That's the whole point. So that those people may be judged, those who do not believe the truth, but delight in injustice. If God takes all the responsibility of sending deception, don't you think he can hide it in his precious word? Of course, you better believe it. Of course. And he does it. Proverbs 25 verse 2 says it. He hides things, matters. And it's the heart of the kings to investigate those matters, remember? So hopefully by now you've seen better how interesting and impressing it is to witness how the God has inspired his word and what delicate balance he has created in it. And this marks the end of our study. This is just for good measure. We already went through it. And this is to end this study. And trust me, everything will work out excellently in the end. Just wait until God has truly accomplished his purpose. He never misses. He always accomplishes his purpose. Well, thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you have enjoyed it and hope to see you next time as well. Bye-bye.